Hello, it's New Year's Eve 2019 2020. About to get into a new decade, and I'll definitely be making videos or a video perhaps around my thoughts on the concept of that and some issues around it. Um, I want to make, I want to talk a bit about something that's going to talk about at the time of the general election, but I could quite write into it on prime ministerial data. Uh, I think it's very interesting. But this is all information you can get online. The source I've been using is Wikipedia because it's handy. Um, I, I find it to be the most straightforward source. I know it's not the most concrete, but it's the most straightforward to use, in my opinion, um, at least that I've come across. So I just want to share some of this data for politicals out there who may find it interesting. Some prime ministerial data from the United Kingdom. Okay, so. Firstly, the whole bit of context and history here, I think, is important. The whole concept of prime minister is um, is interesting because it was never formed as a specific office in the way that the office of, for example, the president of the French Republic or the American president, for that matter, was formed specifically. It sort of came about by accident. Um, I mean, monarchs of England and later Great Britain and the United Kingdom and Scotland uh, before that always had sort of advisors or chief ministers. Um, and this kind of, in the ancient days, this would have been known as the Lord Chancellor, an example being Sir Thomas More under Henry VIII. So they're sort of the pre predecessors of what we now know as prime ministers, although it would be it's not quite a direct translation from that, but it's near enough. Um, so in the 18th century, when political reforms were gradually moving in, or constitutional reforms that really came in in the early 19th century, but were starting to have their foundations at that time, in the wake of the glorious revolution of 1688, when we transitioned from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy, that is really the the beginnings of modern British democracy, certainly not what we know today, but it was the beginnings of that concept. So there were offices, powerful offices, such as the Secretary of State for the Northern Department, the Secretary of State for the Southern Department, and there were ministries headed by particular ministers, but under the nominal title of someone else. So for example, the Stanhop Sunderland Ministry doesn't mean that Stanhop, the Earl of Stanhop or the Earl of Sunderland were necessarily Prime Minister. Um, now, one of these early ministries is uh, generally considered to be, or rather, one of these early individuals heading the ministries, who is generally considered to be the first prime minister, is Sir Robert Walpole. And one reason for this is his particular political um, skills in terms of manoeuvring, his closeness to the monarch at that time, uh, King George II. So we go back to seven. One, the office of prime minister was never exactly formed, but it is Walpole's manoeuvring that is generally seen him in the light of the first prime minister of the United Kingdom. The office was actually formerly the first lord of the treasury, and it still is. Boris Johnson is technically the first lord of the treasury. The chancellor of the Exchequer is the second lord of the treasury. And today's great offices of state: prime minister, chancellor. Foreign Secretary and Home Secretary all have their origins in older offices. The Chancellor, uh, unless I'm mistaken, is the oldest of those offices. In other countries would be known as Finance Minister, and in Britain it's generally considered the second most powerful in government, and a number of Prime Ministers have served as Chancellor. Anyway, not to overcomplicate things, I just followed necessary to give a little bit of background there. So Walpole was the first Prime Minister, and he sort of gained this position through influence on his closeness to the king, he was a royal favourite, essentially. Um, incredibly corrupt, as politics was in those days. Um, and I think it's worth noting that the term Prime Minister only really became formalised as late as 1905 under Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman or Arthur Balfour. So even in the 19th century, we hear about great figures like Palmerston and Gladstone and Disraeli, we call them prime ministers, and they were in everything then, formally. Newspapers may even have referred to them as that, but they were still, at that point, technically first lords of the treasury. So that's an interesting factor. Now, in British politics, 
in the last century, two major parties have dominated, and that is Labour and the Conservatives. Um, in history, it's interesting to look at which parties have produced the most prime ministers, and that is by far um, the uh, Conservatives. Uh, 18 prime ministers, and this is followed by um, the Whigs with 16 prime ministers. And the <laughs> got an intruder in here. About that. So, um, my mum was just coming in too, they knew I was making a video, but anyway. Right, so the Conservatives have produced 18 Prime Ministers, this is followed by the Whigs with 16, the Tories, and I'll explain this in a minute, with 9, Labour with 6, Liberals with 5, and Peelites produced one Prime Minister. Now, uh, it's important to explain a little bit of this. So, the Whigs and the Tories were the two old dominant parties uh, from the 18th, well, from the 17th century up to the early 19th century. And they both formulated roughly around 1678 and summed up, this is very, very loose. The Tories were descended, roughly speaking, from the Cavaliers of the Civil War, that is the, um, the Royalists of the English Civil Wars and the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. And before the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and also the events of the Williamite War in Ireland, um, they came out of opposition to the Exclusion Bill. Now, the Exclusion Bill was a bill passed in Parliament. There was an old English Parliament, um, which was what war was about, but that's muddying the waters. They came out of opposition to the Exclusion Bill. Now, the Exclusion Bill was in opposition to the Catholic um, King James II, um, also known as King James VII. Um, opposition on the grounds that he was a Catholic. The Tories um, support him, whereas the Whigs of the day believed that he was an absolute monarch and uh, a threat to constitutional changes that were happening at that time. The Whigs, by contrast, uh, descend from the Roundheads of the English Civil War, or the Parliamentarians, to be more precise. Um, so the Whigs and the Tories were the two old parties. Uh, so that first Tory faction was formed around 1670 and a second Tory faction uh, was formed in the late 18th century under William Pitt the Younger. This is loosely uh, translated. So the Whigs and the Tories really dominate British politics for um, well over half of our parliamentary history, the old Whigs and the old Tories. The Tories dissolved in 1834 after the Great Reform Act and with the collapse of the Wellington government, that is the Duke of Wellington, the Whigs collapsed in 1859 with the formation of the modern Liberals. So, today, to this day, we still call the Conservatives the Tories because they are in direct lineage from the old Tory party, so they're still known as the Tories in Canada as well. Um, the Whigs are basically, it's now seen as a very archaic term, like I say, they dissolved in 1859. So, of all the parties, the Conservatives have produced the most prime ministers, 18 prime ministers. Andrew Bonnelaw and Alec Douglas Home in the 20th century were technically Scottish Unionists, but that was effectively the, the Conservative Party in Scotland. That's what was known as in the early 20th century. Um, the Whigs, I would say, 16 Whigs, but there were crossover points. So, for example, the Duke of Portland also a Tory at one point in his career. Uh, Lord Palmerston and Lord Russell also became Liberals. In fact, the Liberal Party formed in 1859, generally seen as the second Palmerston administration. Therefore, we could say there was actually seven Liberal Prime Ministers. Um, Palmerston, Russell, Asquith, Lloyd George, Gladstone, Rosebery, and, and um, the other Liberal eludes me now, but that's uh, seven. Labour has produced six Prime Ministers and the party was founded by, among others, Keir Hardy in 1900 as, uh, as an association and it kind of formed into the Labour Party by the 1906 general election. Its Labour Prime Minister was James Ramsay MacDonald, widely known as Ramsay MacDonald, who was actually national Labour. He was in a coalition government um, 
where the largest party was actually held by Stanley Baldwin's Conservatives. Uh, but Ramsay MacDonald was the first Labour Prime Minister. We've had six so far. Um, let's see, uh, one Peelite, Aberdeen, uh, Lord Aberdeen, at the time of the Crimean War. Now, it's worth noting that in the old Whigs and Tories, there were factions, so Hittites, Chathamites, Rockinghamites, and so on, who sort of followed particular leaders. So, for example, the Chathamites followed um, William Pitt the Elder, better known as uh, also the Duke of uh, the Earl of Chatham, excuse me, the Great Commoner. Um, Pittites followed William Pitt the Younger, and so on. So there were factions, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll say those are the um, sort of five parties that have dominated British politics: the Whigs, the Tories, the Conservatives, the Liberals, and Labour. So uh, that brings me to um, length of tenure. Now, this is interesting. Um, looking at the top 10 longest serving prime ministers and bearing in mind that Walpole's office was not formally constructed as a political office. Uh, Sir Robert Walpole, 20 years, 314 days, an incredibly long time by modern standards. That's from the period 1721 to 1742, very long period. That's followed by William Pitt the Younger, uh, 18 years and 340 days, 43 days. Um, Lord Liverpool, and I should emphasize that at this time, prime ministers were known by their titles. So when we see Liverpool in history books, that's Lord Liverpool. His actual name was Robert Banks Jenkinson, the second Earl of Liverpool, but the name was Liverpool. So that's just a reference from now on. Then um, the Marquess of Salisbury, 13 years, 252 days. Um, William York Gladstone, 12 years, 126 days. Lord North, 12 years, 58 days. Margaret Thatcher, longest of modern times, 11 years, 208 days. Henry Pelham, 10 years, 191 days. Tony Blair, 10 years and 56 days. And Lord Palmerston, Viscount Palmerston, 9 years and 141 days. So they're the only prime ministers to have secured over nine years in office. Um, only two Prime Ministers were born outside the British Isles, which was Andrew Bonner Law, widely known as Bonner Law, and our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who was born in New York City, to a British family. Um, William York Gladstone was the only Prime Minister to serve four non-consecutive terms. Uh, below that, most Prime Ministers served either a single term, two terms, or in some cases, three terms. In the 18th and 19th century, there was a lot of flip-flopping between different leaders. And the only example of that in modern times I can think of is Churchill's two terms and Harold Wilson's two terms. Now, by contrast, the shortest serving prime ministers, um, George Canning, 119 days, Viscount Godric, 144 days. Boris Johnson's currently 158 days, but it looks like he's going to serve a full term, so we won't include him there. Andrew Bonner Law, 211 days. The Duke of Devonshire, 225 days. The Earl of Shelburne, 266 days. The Earl of Butte, 317 days. The Earl of Butte, incidentally, was the last royal favourite to become Prime Minister. Sir Alec Douglas Home, some would pronounce it Sir Alec Douglas Hume, 363 days. Lord Grenville, Grenville Jr., that is, or Grenville the Younger, one year and 42 days. The Duke of Grafton, one year and 106 days. And the Earl of Rosebury, one year and 109 days. It's interesting considering the longest serving leaders of the opposition, and that is, in modern times at least, Neil Kinnock is the longest serving leader of the opposition, followed by Clement Attlee, Hugh Gateskill, Winston Churchill, and uh, Edward Heath. Okay, the median length of time for a prime minister in this country actually works out at three years and eight months, which is between uh, Edward Heath and Charles Gray, Lord uh, Earl Grey, to which the tea is named, drinking it right now, so Earl Grey. Um, no Prime Minister served a four-year period. Uh, it's between um, Ted Heath and Sir Robert Peel, uh, almost four years and just over five years. So that gives a sort of idea. Not very long time, three years and eight months would be roughly the medium time for a British Prime Minister. Now, 
Um, looking at age, this is an interesting one for me. Um, six living prime ministers at the moment, including uh, the current incumbent Boris Johnson, the others being Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May and John Major. That's about uh, the highest there has been of living numbers of prime ministers at the same time. There's been several other points in history where, where there have been six living prime ministers. The youngest prime minister on first appointment, William Pitt the Younger, aptly named, 24 years old when he became prime minister in 1783, which is truly astonishing. Duke of Grafton, also very young, 33. Lord Rockingham, 35. The Duke of Devonshire, 36. Lord North, 37. Lord Liverpool, 42. David Cameron, the youngest in modern times, 43 years and 214 days when he became prime minister. I mean, Cameron's rise was remarkable, just nine years as an MP. Um, Henry Addington, um, 43. Tony Blair, 43 years and 361 days. And Sir Robert Walpole was just 44 when he became Prime Minister. Um, the youngest Prime Ministers to die, uh, I mean, age of death. The Duke of Devonshire was only 44 in 1754 when he died. William Pitt the Younger suffered from all sorts of chronic illnesses mental health problems as well, died in 1806 at the age of 46. Spencer Percival, 1812, he had 49, and they're the only three Prime Ministers not to make it to the age of 50. Now, Spencer Percival remains the only British Prime Minister to have been assassinated, whilst there have been attempts on other Prime Ministers, um, such as the IRA mortar attack on John Major in 1991. The only Prime Minister to have actually been assassinated, Spencer Percival, in 1812. Um, and that was in the lobby of the House of Commons. Um, and the assassin, Henry Bellingham, disgruntled with the Prime Minister on a personal basis for a range of reasons. And after his public execution, the name Bellingham, apparently the family had to change the name. The low Percival wasn't a hugely popular Prime Minister. This was still a historic event. The only Prime Minister to have been assassinated. Um, now, the oldest Prime Ministers on leaving office, uh, William Ewart Gladstone was 84 years old when he left office in 1894, Winston Churchill, 80 years old when he left office in 1955, and Benjamin Disraeli, 75, when he left office in 1880. The oldest Prime Ministers on first appointment, now a lot of people might think, oh, Churchill, old man. Actually, Churchill isn't at the top of the list. That goes to Lord Palmerston, 70 years old on first appointment as Prime Minister in 1855, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, 69, Lord Aberdeen, 68, um, the Earl of Wilmington, 68, Neville Chamberlain, 68, uh, Earl Grey, 66, Winston Churchill on the first appointment in 65, still an old man, but not at the very top of the list, um, Andrew Bonner Law, 64, James Callaghan, 64, and Benjamin Disraeli, 63. The major age for Prime Ministers on appointment is 55, which is actually Boris Johnson's age. That falls right smack bang in the middle, which incidentally is the same with the American presidents. Um, and let's see, uh, we're rounding this up soon. Only seven Prime Ministers died in office, which is uh, Wilmington, Palmerston, Pelham, Canning, Rocking and Percival. Um, the shortest length of retirement that is leaving office, Henry Campbell Bannerman, just 17 days, and he passed away. The Duke of Portland, 26 days. Uh, the longest retirement, the Duke of Grafton, 41 years, 45 days, followed by Henry Addington, 39 years. Rosebery, that is rounding up, 33 years. Edward Heath, 31 years, and Alec Douglas Home, 30 years, almost 31 years. Um, the oldest Prime Ministers on death, James Callaghan was 92 years and 364 days, Harold Macmillan 92 years and 322 days, Alec Douglas Home 92 years and 99 days, and Winston Churchill 90 years and 55 days. They're the only Prime Ministers to live over the age of 90. The oldest living Prime Minister stands is John Major who is 76. So. That is some prime ministerial data. Um, I take responsibility for any mistakes herein. I've been using this pen, this quill, to write my notes on this.
I actually got this at Lancaster Castle in Radon. This was a stocking filler. And my parents got it at Lancaster Castle. I visited Lancaster a few days ago with my father. Fascinating city, fascinating castle. And I will uh, round up here. Uh, so any data that is inaccurate, I take full responsibility for. And feel free to ask questions below. And thanks for watching.